all sorts of things happen along the way. Uh, you do have to remain calm even if you don't feel that way. Like inside yourself, you might be like screaming, ah! But you have to put on a calm facade uh, because if you, the captain, remains looking calm at least, it will keep the crew calm. Fake uh, it till you make it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Andy here. Quick note, we are starting to publish the podcast on YouTube now for this season. So every episode, the audio will be published on YouTube and where we have video um, of interviews, uh, of panels, of whatever, that will be on YouTube as well. As it happens, we filmed this panel in Annapolis last year. Jacob, who works for us as one of our videographers, actually had three cameras in the room and made a really awesome film of this panel. So if you want to see the panel and see a really well-done production on it, go check out our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash at 59 North Sailing. Um, it's the exact same audio as the podcast, but you get to actually see the people on the panel and see it in video. And like I said, the rest of this season will be also published on YouTube. And when we have video of the interview, I will make sure to let you know in the podcast. Thanks. On the Wind is supported this season by Forbes Horton Yachts. Hey guys, it's Lee here, and I recently sold my Tiana 37 Satori. I ended up not using a broker, and now I wish that I had. Um, making the listing and talking to interested buyers wasn't really a problem since I knew the boat really well, but what was an issue is moving the deal along as the sale progressed. In addition to not really knowing the process, we went through multiple buyer's agents and multiple surveyors to find good people to get the deal completed, and looking back, it would have been easier and a lot less stress and, and just worth it to go ahead and get in touch with Forbes to have him handle the whole thing. So if you're looking to buy or sell a boat, we here at 59 North can't recommend Forbes Horton Yachts enough. Get in touch with Forbes at ForbesYachts.com. That's F-O-R-B-E-S Yachts.com. Hey, Adam Brown here, bosun for 59 North. This season of On the Wind is supported by Dive Blue, makers of tankless diving systems. Dive Blue manufactures portable battery powered swallow diving systems that run between 60 to 90 minutes per charge. These systems work by having the main unit float on the surface, which connects to the diver using a hose and a smart regulator that controls the air supply. This all fits neatly into a carry on size backpack, too. It's similar to the scuba systems of old, but without the weight, complexity, and the noise and smell of an engine needed to run it. We have a Nomad system on board Falcon for when we arrive into Bermuda. This unit will save us from regularly paying for divers, as I'll be using it to clean the hole, but also to inspect critical areas like the rudder, prop, anodes, and through holes. Not having to hold my breath means the whole inspection can be much more thorough. I'm excited to use this system to go look around some reefs and see some wildlife while we're on anchor too. Having the benefits of a full scuba setup on board without needing lots of kit and compressors sounds way more efficient and therefore more fun. Head on over to DiveBlue.com to check out the various setups they offer. That's D-I-V-E-B-L-U, the number three, dot com. Thanks again to DiveBlue for supporting this season of the podcast. Ahoy, shipmates, and welcome back to another new season of On the Wind. I am your host, Andy Shell, and we've got a lot of exciting stuff going on for you now. Um, this first episode, we've been saving for uh, a long time. This was a panel discussion that we recorded at the boat show last fall in Annapolis in October. I hosted it uh, with Nikki. We had Pam Wall, Kristen Barry, one of our skippers, Matt Rutherford, who needs no introduction, Ryan Ellison from Dakota Lithium, and a friend of mine, Emma Garshagen, of course, 59 North's uh, chief mate at the time, now um, relief mate as she's on to bigger and better things with her own boat, but still works for us, and Phil Gutowski, um, who is a longtime friend and um, works as a systems expert. Um, the reason we're publishing this panel now, and I give you some more context onto who these who these people all are uh, at the beginning of the episode um, when the panel is introduced. But the reason I'm doing this now is we are doing this event again in Annapolis in the fall, um, but we're blowing it out. It's going to be the biggest and the best offshore sailing workshop that we've ever put together. Mia and I have done events like this for many years, and we're doubling down this year with Nikki's help. Nikki and I are running it, and we're really going to make this... Um, useful, entertaining, and educational mostly, uh, or sorry, most importantly. Um, the show, the workshop's going to run Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So the Wednesday is the day before the boat show, and then Thursday, Friday, um, uh, during the boat show, 
You can do all three days, which we highly encourage because that gives you the full gamut of everything we're going to talk about, or you can choose two or just one day. So basically, each day is discreetly useful on its own. The first day is going to be seamanship scenarios where we go through and Nikki and I talk about real-life things that have happened to us and how we've handled them and how you think about them. So that's like a leadership and decision-making day. Day two is going to be weather forecasting and weather routing. So Nikki, myself, and the guys from WRI will spend the entire day talking about what I think is the most important part of ocean sailing, and that's learning how to understand uh, the weather and anticipate the weather. Then on Friday, we're doing a day where we bring in a bunch of guest experts to talk about various fields that they're expert in. Um, I'm very excited to announce that Nigel Calder is going to headline this day for us, and Nigel is going to talk about electrical systems and systems in general. We've got Chuck O'Malley from Chesapeake Sailmakers, longtime sailmaker for us, uh, going back to early 2000s when I first moved to Annapolis. Chuck's going to talk about how sails affect your boat. We're going to have Meg Riley from the Magenta Project talking about how to how we can encourage women into sailing, um, both uh, on a on a small level with our family and friends, but also on a on an industry level and talk about um, how that works. Meg has a variety uh, var- varied background in sailing herself, um, and then we've got a couple more topics, including troubleshooting. Um, we're going to talk about essential tools and systems and a few more things on that day, and then the day is going to end with a panel discussion with all these people, um, including some extra special guests that we can't quite announce yet, but we'll be able to soon. So that's a mouthful, but it's all happening in October, and we're very excited. Um, The other major guest announcement is Hawken, the leader of the Stormweather Shanty Choir. Yes, the guys that sing the sea shanties that we talk about on this podcast and play on this podcast. He is coming all the way from Norway to give a lecture on sea shanties and provide entertainment for the whole week. Um, The last part of this week on Thursday night, this is included if you book all three days of the seminar, but you can just come to the Thursday night event. We're doing a social event, which is going to include a panel discussion at the start, some shanty entertainment by Hulken, and then basically a place just to connect with other like-minded sailors who have uh, sailed their own boats offshore, sailed with us at 59 North, uh, and you'll get to meet all the panelists that are going to be there on Friday. So Nigel Calder will be there, Meg's going to be there, Chuck's going to be there. Um, It's a chance to kind of get people in an informal setting and ask questions and hang out and have a share a beer or two. So um, all that's happening. Go to 59-north.com slash seamanship, or you can just go straight to the homepage. Start signing up for that now, and uh, we'll see you in the fall in Annapolis. And hopefully this seminar, uh, this panel discussion that we're playing today uh, gets you excited for it because this is just a small preview of what's happening um, at the Boat Show next year. All right, here we go. You're listening to On The Wind, the podcast about offshore sailing. I'm your host, Andy Schell. Today's episode is a panel discussion hosted by myself and Nikki Henderson, and including guests Pam Wall, Kristen Berry, Matt Rutherford, Ryan Ellison, Emma Garshagen, and Phil Gutowski. This is a wide-ranging panel on all things relevant to ocean sailing from these very experienced people's perspectives and stories that they shared and best practices. Um, Lots of fun, lots of educational tidbits in here. So get your notebook, take some notes, and listen to what our friends have to say about ocean sailing. We're going to start the afternoon session. This is going to be um, a little bit more in-depth and a little less planned. Where Nikki and I talked about big picture items, now we're going to get opinions from people that have actually been out there doing it and how they've done things on their boat specifically. Um, So you know Nikki and I already, and you know Pam, who we introduced earlier. Uh, So to Pam's right, we have Kristen Berry, KB. He's um, an old Annapolis friend of mine since I first moved here in 2006. He's a coach for the Naval Academy, he's skippered for us a bunch, and he's a full-time sailor. How many days a year do you spend at sea? Uh, 300 plus. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then we have Pam, who we, we know mostly about already. Um, Matt Rutherford. Matt is also an old friend from Annapolis. I first met Matt when he came back from his first solo transatlantic before he went around the Americas. Uh, and Matt, if you want to tell us where you just came back from just the other day... Uh, I think you've been up in Greenland. 
Uh, yeah, just uh, about 30 hours ago, got back from Greenland, uh, run an ocean research organization. We go up into uncharted areas and do a bunch of climate research and we made it back. Well, here we are. <laughs> um, Matt, of course, I used you as an example this morning for saying that it's not about the boat that makes it uh, seaworthy or not. It's the person driving it. Matt went around North and South America alone and nonstop in an Alban Vega, a 27 foot boat that he dumpster dived to finish. Um, and, uh, and here he is. And the boat is where the boat still exists as well. Is it, uh, where is it these days, Matt? Uh, yeah, I, I really wanted to, to bring it back to life and I got like a new Yanmar for it and went through all the stuff. And then we, we got a boat donated to the nonprofit, which was a 65 foot steel schooner that had been abandoned and I couldn't do both projects. So somebody in Charleston has it in her backyard and they're, they're bringing her back to life, uh, so she can sail again. Awesome. Emma Garshagen, next to Matt. Emma met us in 2019, and I immediately offered her a full-time job because she made <laughs> such a great first impression. Incidentally, she sailed her first trip with 59 North with uh, Matt on East Bjorn from Newport down to here. Um, Emma did her first skipper job at Broadreach earlier this summer and spent, what, a week sailing on Maiden, the, um, the first all-female boat in the Whitbread um, a few weeks ago. And Emma works full-time for 59 North and has sailed with all of us, I think, KB, me, and Nikki. Uh, on our various trips. Um, Ryan Ellison, we met earlier with Ryan and Sophie. Ryan's background is in aviation. He was a fighter pilot in the military for a while. Um, we, Ryan, you and I talk a lot about risk management. Um, Ryan's also one of our sponsors for this event. He is one of the founders of Dakota Lithium. So we've got Dakota Lithium batteries on my little boat, Spica, in Sweden, and on the new boat, Falcon, as well. Uh, and Phil, how do you say your last name? Gutowski. Phil Gutowski. We know each other through Sail Magazine. It was kind of serendipitous that Phil got in touch for this boat show and said, hey, you should be on the panel. I know the least about Phil than I know the rest of the people on the panel. But in a nutshell, <laughs> Phil runs, um, uh, why don't you describe what Boat RX is because I'm going to get it wrong. Well, I'm going to have the dissenting opinion amongst the panel because we make boats more complicated <laughs> and, and, uh, and more comfortable. Uh, and we're a battery-powered air conditioning company. So there you go. Uh, and Phil also is a sailor himself. You have a Tiana Vancouver 42. And actually, I'm gonna ask Phil to start us off with, a, with some story time. Um, I don't know if you like telling this story or not, Phil, but I like hearing it. Phil, uh, Phil lost his boat for a time in Biscayne <laughs> Bay in, in Miami. Um, what happened there, Phil? This is a story of complacency. <laughs> <laughs> I came home from work on a Friday night uh, after dark took my dinghy about a mile out into the mooring field. Uh, and I was working more than sailing at the time, so the boat was on, on a mooring. and uh, The mooring was there, but the boat was gone. And uh, the wind was up, and uh, I, I felt uh, really utterly in shock. Uh, I, I would equate it to, if you own a house, like how you might feel if you came home and your house was on fire. Because uh, all of the things you know and love were now all of a sudden gone. And I'd lived on the boat for six years. So the story goes on, it could be quite long, but we'll save that. But uh, we ended up um, searching for the boat uh, as best we could with the, with the little tender that I had, calling the Coast Guard, calling all the authorities, hiring boats. The weather was pretty severe for a few days and, and nobody could find it, no one had seen it. And by the third day of crashing on a friend's couch, and by the time the social media post had gone viral, uh, we still hadn't found the boat. It wasn't until the weather cleared that uh, I hired a seaplane and uh, we, we found the boat with the seaplane and uh, actually landed right next to it. I got off the seaplane, the boat was uh, stuck in the, in the sand in the Biscayne National Park, uh, but uh, the fridge was still cold, I still had food on board, and uh, I, I said goodbye to the seaplane, and um, uh, a few hours later, or half a day later, when the tide was up, uh, a bunch of money and uh, two sea tow boats towed me on my side out of there, and we put it back on the mooring. And today it's in Port Annapolis, just in back Creek. It is, yeah. <laughs> Still sailing, awesome. Check your mooring lines. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, I'll save you from telling uh, your mooring ball story. We'll save that for later. Um, all right, so how this is gonna work. Uh, we're gonna try to frame this around the, the four main topics that Nikki and I are covering today and tomorrow. So preparation at sea, which we covered this morning, tomorrow's emergencies and weather. We're gonna keep it under that sort of umbrella, but we're gonna dive a little bit more specifically into your guys' own experiences. And I'm gonna ask the panel to start a conversation. Nikki's gonna take over and drill a little bit deeper into these different topics, and the hope is that these guys um, 
politely discuss and debate amongst themselves on each topic, and then I'll bring it back and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so where I, I want to start a little bit esoterically, and Matt, I'm going to start with you, um, because I actually, however you answer this question, I actually don't believe whatever you're going to say, because I just don't believe that you, you feel the same way that other people do. And the question is, how do you, how do you handle fear uh, at sea? Um, uh, Matt, I'll let, you, I'll let you start this off. All right. I think that, you know, it, it kind of goes back to how do you cross an ocean? You point your boat at the, you know, where you want to go and you keep going until you get to wherever that location is. Um, you have to, there's a certain amount of acceptance that needs to happen in the ocean. Uh, of course, it is a hazardous environment. It's a place that we are not supposed to live as homo sapiens. Um, and ultimately, you do have to accept, there's a, there's a whole mental aspect to sailing that really can't be taught. It's something you have to find yourself. And uh, the problem with fear is fear becomes panic. Panic becomes injury uh, or damage to the vessel. And, uh, and, it, and ultimately, it could be loss of life or loss of vessel or any of that. Uh, nothing ever is beneficial from freaking out. There's pretty much no situation in life that freaking out uh, is going to help you, unless it's like some Halloween, I don't know, haunted house or something like that. I can't think of many. Uh, and so how do you control... I mean, everybody has fear. It's not like, it's something you have to overcome. Uh, if you don't learn to control your fear, your fear will control you. But it's not like you've lost touch with fear. But it is a big part. And as a captain of a vessel, I just had seven to nine people on this 120-day expedition going up to Greenland and all sorts of things happen along the way. Uh, you do have to remain calm even if you don't feel that way. Like inside yourself, you might be like screaming, ah! But you have to put on a calm facade uh, because if you, the captain, remains looking calm, at least, it will keep the crew calm. Fake uh, it till you make it. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but yeah, I think that the mental aspects of sailing probably don't get talked about enough. We talk a lot about reefing and gear and equipment and this and that. Uh, but there is a mentality necessary uh, to cross an ocean. And it has nothing to do with being fearless. It just has to do with learning how to control your fear uh, so it doesn't control you. And accepting the fact that we're not supposed to be out there in the first place. So things might happen, something bad might happen. And if you accept it ahead of time, when it does happen, you'll be more than, you know, at least a little more likely not to panic when it goes down. I think, uh, believe it or not, many of us go to sea to seek fear, um, to touch the void, to find out where our limits are. And so for me, I, I get fearful on almost every trip at some point, and it becomes the fodder, the spark, the incentive to address that, whatever that may be. So for me, with, if I, at the, I'm reflecting on a trip, you, even just down the bay, for instance, something spooked me somewhere along the way, probably. Um, and I use that to um, sort of set the priority for what I want to do next. Maybe that's, I need to fix something on the boat because something didn't work and that brought anxiety or fear to me. And I think each one of us processes fear quite differently. Some of us, it causes us to kind of drill down and get serious. Others, it can be debilitating. Um, somewhere in between is where most of us lie. So, but I know for me personally, and, and for most of the po folks that I work with, that's part of the attraction of, of what draws us out there is finding our, our limit to some degree. Uh, right. I actually have a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press you guys harder. Um, you're talking about your own fear. Um, what about managing other people's fear? Anyone have anything? <laughs> You know, I'm looking out here at the audience and uh, I'm imagining you all at sea. And, uh, and I believe that I, I'm a, I work helping people be better as teams. Um, whatever their goal is, I help them be better at teams. And one of the things that I think is really important in that is that everybody is entitled to the material that they need to be successful. Mm -hmm. Everybody is entitled to the material that they need to be successful. And so fear is oftentimes not, is an irrational response to not understanding the solution to a problem. And so suddenly you get freaked out, right? So as a leader on trips where I've got folks who are dramatically less experienced than I am, one of my jobs is to be empathetic and listen to what it is that they're calling out for but don't have the words to describe. And then I try to not rationalize with them, but rather coach and teach that, okay, well, look, this, this is a little frightening and it's 
extra frightening for you because you don't understand what could happen next. So let's go down the scenarios and let's talk about those. And if you can do that, and it, it's, it takes a little art to make that happen, but if you can do that in moments of extremis, you can get people to rationalize with the situation and find their own pathway to the solution. And so um, there are times where it is important that there is a leader and that leader has ultimate control. But at the same time, I think empathetic leaders in small group dynamics in particular, say husband and wife teams that are thinking about crossing an ocean, you got to figure out how to connect and give the other person what they need to be successful in that moment because they can't find it on their own. Pam, this sounds like something. a... Oh, really quickly. How many here have children sail with them? Oh, okay. Well, then I'm going to tell you the only thing that I ever feared while sailing was that something would happen to my children. And I handled it this way. Uh, one time, Jamie, when he was five years old, disappeared on the, on the dock, on the deck midway between the Galapagos and the Marquesas. And of course, Andy and I were shouting, looking everywhere, and we finally found him. Our tender, our uh, solid tender, uh, was uh, lashed on the foredeck, just so that there was about seven inches that a little kid could crawl underneath. The perfect fort. And he fell asleep. I mean, we were screaming along probably about eight and a half knots, you know, with uh, pulled out Genoa and everything. So. Um, we were looking in the wake all the time, and and anyway, he finally crawled out from underneath the, the tender, and and the way I handled it, I spanked him. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but Sorry, that I mean, that is, out the witch handle. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how I handled my fear. But <laughs> what I wanted to tell you is, you know, when I first started sailing with Andy Wall, I had been sailing a long time with my father, but I was always just the one that handed up the beer and the cold sandwiches because he was racing all the time. And it was my husband, Andy, who said to me, Pammy, you've got to become a co-skipper with me. I've got to teach you everything that I know. Don't forget, he sailed across the Pacific around Cape Horn. This guy knew what he was doing. And he said, I don't want you to be a passenger. I want you to be a full member of the crew, and if anything happens to me, you can handle this boat anywhere. And that eliminated all my fear. I mean, it was being taught what he knew, and I knew that he knew a lot. And I became a part of the crew, and I never was afraid of anything except perhaps maybe a bolt of lightning that never happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I do. I same same with me or same experience. You know, I work with a lot of racing teams in addition to the cruising work that I do, and I'll oftentimes have a little sit down with the the, the crew members and try to what do we really need to do to unlock this team, right? And used to be, oftentimes there was a screaming helmsman, uh, and not a helms person, a screaming helmsman uh, uh, who was disrupting the energy of the boat, and. Almost always the screaming helms person is screaming or yelling or raising their voice because of fear and anxiety. They don't want someone to get hurt, but they don't have the material they need to help in that situation, and so they yell. Um, and that is a clear sign that we have things we need to work on, you know? And, I, and that's really a cool story, Pam, that, that you were the co-skipper in that. I'm a 100% believer in that style. Well, I have to tell you one other thing. Our children were four and seven when we took off for a seven-year circumnavigation. And actually, we told our parents we'd be back in two years, but we lied. <laughs> anyway, uh, we taught our children the same as my husband taught me so that we never had to be afraid of our kids when they were on deck unless they fell asleep underneath the tender. <laughs> you know, So uh, it, was, it was a wonderful uh, way of teaching us as well as our children uh, that you don't fear anything, you take care of it the right way. And um, those kids steered around the boat, around the world on that boat, two hours on and six hours off, all the way around the world. And learning that responsibility, uh, I think, helped them in their future lives. So uh, this is a good segue <laughs> into something a bit more specific than just generally how we handle fear. Um, Ryan, I'm going to start this discussion with you. I promised we'd debate about um, satcoms. You and I, when you were getting ready for your, I think for your solo transatlantic, yeah. Yeah. we were talking about Iridium Go versus Iridium Handset. So just briefly, if you don't know what I'm talking about, 
And Iridium Go is a, a black box device that creates a Wi-Fi network. You use it to download weather, communicate, send emails, and you can connect to it with a smartphone and make a call. An Iridium handset is just what it sounds like. It's a big old 80s style car phone that you can pick up and actually make a call with. And um, I think, Ryan, if you want to provide the context to what started this conversation and where it went before I ask a, I have a specific question for you, and then I have a, uh, something I want to share with Emma as well. So we've always, when, when we started ocean crossing, doing ocean sailing and long passages, we went the satellite route because there's a benefit to having offshore weather. Uh, and so the Iridium Go, Go really is the best tool for that right now, I think. Um, and the discussion came up on what we should have as a backup because the passage before my solo crossing, um, we were in the middle of the Atlantic and our Iridium Go died. So we didn't have any weather and it was going west to east. So it's, a, it's not a trade wind passage. You do need to be searching for weather, although you can make it without. Um, so Andy and I just started having discussions about, well, if I'm on my own, what's the best way to have communication both for weather and then also if something happens. Um, and I think the original discussion was uh, if I should just have an Iridium Go and then a in reach, uh, which is just a SMS device, uh, which is what we had when we lost our Iridium Go, but it wasn't activated. So we had to have a tanker ship uh, call on their sat phone to activate it for us, <laughs> which did work. It took four days to make it work, but it did work. Uh, but it was a pain in the butt to make it work. It did work. Um, so it's, it's a balance. The discussion I think for us was what's safe and what's cost effective. You know, and this is, it's partly safety. So you got to, you're balancing that cost piece with safety. So that's some background there. And where I'm leading with this is I, I've long argued that um, you can have a handset because you can make it work like a Go works by using a couple different pieces of hardware and create a Wi Fi network and download weather. Um, so that can do dual purpose, dual service, but an Iridium Go is not enough. Because if you really need it in an emergency to work, you're relying on several layers of technology, like Phil said, making the boats more complicated. And the worst case scenario, if you've got to take that in the life raft with you, with your smartphone, it has to be charged, all that stuff, you're, you're relying on a lot of complication. And I'm segueing this conversation into, I kind of want to talk about, Emma, the experience. We don't have to go into the details. We had a medical emergency on Ice Bear. And I was in Sweden. You were on the boat. KB was on the boat as well. Um, but... How did it feel for you guys on the boat to be able to pick up that phone and communicate off the boat in terms of how that also managed your, your fear in the, in the moment? Uh, and I kind of, because I, I can tell my side of the story after Emma tells her side of the story. Because I'll tell you what, as shore support, when you get a number that starts with 8816 coming in from your phone, that's an Iridium sat phone number, that is never a good call to receive. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, quick background, uh, KB and I were on our way from Bermuda to Maine, uh, and we were headed into a night of rougher weather. We'd had a passage of a subtropical, post-tropical storm, and then we also had a cold front. So we were getting ready for heavy weather, and the boat was, we were downwind and um, relatively big seas, and everything was rolling around, and we had one crew member sort of bump their head and come up above and tell me I was coaching people at the helm um, for steering in the waves. And the crew member was like, hey, I bumped my head. I'm OK. Um, but I knew people were sort of slipping around down below and not holding on properly. And then the next inf piece of information I got from down below was that was just another crew member popping up with a ghost white face. And I didn't ask what happened. I just went down below and saw the starboard side of the boat was sort of painted red. Um, and someone had fallen from the port side across Ice Bear's 16-foot beam to the starboard side, and the back of their head met the bookshelf, and there's still a piece of wood missing from the bookshelf. And the person who this happened to is okay. I hear from him uh, semi-frequently. <laughs> He's all, all good. Um, but that was the scenario. Uh, and we didn't actually call you, Andy, until after um, we had this sort of situation under control, because when it happened, it was just like, okay, like, no, not even, no thinking, just like doing uh, what needed to happen, and, and we did it, and uh, yeah, the boat was still sailing, and so um, we had a lot to manage all at once, but then once we knew that our patient was stable, um, then I called Andy, uh, and we'd emailed our doctor on shore, but hadn't, hadn't heard back, so we sort of called Andy and was, was like, this is what happened, can you communicate with our doctor, and then knowing that, yeah, knowing that we had a touch point on land then who could, who could help us out, in getting more information to continue care with the patient and, and just to sort of yeah have a tether to land because we were out there. We were outside of helicopter range at that point. So 
Uh, it, was it was equidistant to get to yeah. the East Coast or go back to Bermuda. Yeah, which was another back decision. Back to Bermuda was not a favorable option given the weather window. Yeah, and, and it would have been dead up wind if we turned around, um, which wouldn't have been too friendly either. So, uh, so we had a lot of decisions to make at once, but it was really nice to have that tether back to shore. And then the doctor was able to email back and sort of comfort us that we were doing the right things and, and give us things to look out for. Do you have a, a question up front? Mm. Um, so the question was if we use a dedicated doctor service uh, that supports people at sea. Uh, we, do, we did not at the time. We were, I think, going to with Falcon because our med kit provider has a service that's associated with our med kit, which is really nice. So they know the med kit we have uh, and the kind of sailing we do. Um, but we have a, a separate doctor who has sailed with us in the past who is an emergency doctor and, and a sailor. Um, so we've been able to do it sort of through a friend, which has been really nice, and he knows our, our system really well. But there are, uh, MSOS is our med kit provider, and they also have doctors on call, um, which would be nice to have as well, because um, they are really on call, whereas our friend is on call, but also has other things going on. So. What was that uh, service again? MSOS. Mm -hmm. MSOS. Yeah. Um, so Emma, what I wanted to come out of that experience was like, you, the point I want to make um, is that you guys are trained professionals. You had gone to the med course, and yet still you had comfort in being able to pick up the phone and call someone. Yeah. And my point back to Ryan was, in the moment, when you're on your own with, with your you know, amateur, untrained family, and back to what Pam said, if you have a family member that suddenly gets injured, um, it's very easy to let that fear creep into panic and, and you're going to want to be able to talk to someone. So that's simply my, my point in the, in the, how you prioritize your safety equipment. I think, uh, so Andy and I had a lot of discussion about this and in the end I ended up getting a dedicated sat phone and I agree, we agree now, I think on, on where that is. Cause when I was solo, I did have a situation come up and having, uh, I was out of VHF range and I was needing to relay messages to the Coast Guard through Sophie and having that phone that is built for those conditions that you just one stop shop, you pick it up, you don't have to be connecting through with any other thing. It's just simple, easy. It's got everybody's phone numbers in it. Uh, that is that's the way to go. So you need to have, so, I think, a dedicated device like that. And then, you know, well, we can get into the whole technology debate uh, later, but technology is such an integral part to have a dedicated device that has internet for you or some type of way to download uh, small packets of information is also important. So I'm a big fan of Uranium Go to, to get on the other side here, I guess, a little. Um, I used to have a Motorola 9505A, which was uh, Uranium used to be owned by Motorola. They broke off. Um, that one, you had to get the extra modem attachment. I think it was called a red dot, basically turn it into a hotspot. I think they still have that. Uh, yeah, you can still get it. And they're, they're great phones. Uh, I think they're better than the Iridium version. The new Iridium versions are actually a knockdown from the old Motorola versions. Um, and when I, I sailed once from San Francisco to Yokohama, Japan, nonstop, we used that system, but it's a bit clunky. Uh, and I've been using the Iridium Go ever since, probably about 700 days at sea or something with the Iridium Go. I'm on my fourth one, they do break. It's yep, good yep, to have a backup. <laughs> and they were very glitchy in the beginning. Uh, but if I had to pick one, I would personally pick Iridium Go because of the unlimited data package that you can get. It's the, you cannot get that with a hand phone. And if you want to get weather forecasting uh, through Predict Wind is what I use or whatever you want to use, uh, you can pull up forecast basically unlimited and you have unlimited texting. So you can communicate people via text message. Uh, I think it's great to have a backup yeah. Uh, hand phone. Uh, you need a different SIM card, by the way. Your Ure Uridium Go SIM card will not work in your hand phone. So you can't just pull the SIM out. You have to actually have a different SIM card for that. Uh, but yeah, redundancy for communication and, uh, and modern day weather forecasting uh, via a Uridium Go are game changers for safety. Yeah. I, I have one more. And then um, there's, because my sailing was done long before all, all of this that you're talking about, uh, I became a ham radio operator. And uh, back, in, but back in those days, it was really difficult to become a ham radio operator. I'm not going to go into it, but I became one. And my husband ended up calling me the mouth of the south <laughs> and, and the tongue of the ocean because I loved it so much. But we used that on only one medical emergency. And all you have to do is put out CQ, 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 which means someone's, anyone who's listening, come back to me. And someone will come back to you right away. Uh, because that means there's an emergency. 
and we, we didn't have an emergency board. I have to be a little bit light here, Andy, <laughs> but um, um, our, our original cockpit seat for the helmsman was just a, a piece of wood, and because we never finished our boat before we left, and and he got this great big boil on, on his bum, okay? <laughs> you know, because when you cross the Indian Ocean, for those of you who've crossed it, the, the seas are all sideways. So you're not going like this, you're going like this the whole time. Anyway, and, and, and as you know, we steered the whole way. And he got this big boil, so I called CQ and I got a guy, a uh, doctor in South Africa, which was about, you know, 3,000 miles away. And he told me to, uh, to check the size of it every day and to check the color of the pus every day. And it was getting worse what antibiotics I had aboard the boat. And he told me exactly what to take. Anyway, it was the right advice and it started going away. But he told me, I want you to come on the radio every day and tell me what color the pus is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and we get, we get into Durban and... and all these people are there to take our lines, you know, boats we've never seen before. <laughs> and, you know, um, ham radio, anyone who's listening can hear. <laughs> and um, as, we, as we tossed our dock lines ashore after this long passage across the Indian Ocean, they went, one, two, three. What color is your pus today, Andy? LAUGHTER um. I'm going to um, just jump in there on the, continuing the subject of whether you um, like to have the phone or the, the go. I've definitely been in scenarios where I've called the wrong person or I've had the wrong conversation and that's actually set an emergency, um, my own head on the wrong foot. Can you guys think of any scenarios, um, maybe KB you haven't answered, where... Um, Actually, it was better to send an email than to have a phone call. Well, yeah, I actually, I do think so. And, um, you know, one of the nice things about email is that um, you can set up a distribution. So you can hit more than one person with one send. And because of the instability of satcoms at sea, that's really nice um, to, to be able to, to hit more than one person. Because you may be able to make that phone call for two or three minutes, lose it, and you've lost that window for a little while. You know, I think um, kind of back to the general topic, sailing is three-dimensional chess that is best played in the future, not in the moment. If you're reacting, you're losing. And so while you're all sitting out here right now, you can think through the scenarios that you're hearing us talk about and how would you plan to react to those. You need to have both a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And if you're really good, you'll go deeper than that because those first couple aren't always going to work out for you. Uh, and so redundancy, as Matt said, is super important when we're at sea. And I think in the SATCOM world, that's really important. Um, I carry both an Iridium Go and a dedicated handset now. I have not pulled out the handset in a long time because the Go has gotten very good. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a comfort for me. But that's not enough either. I need to know what other opportunities and avenues are there for me to communicate beyond those two. Um, so who's in the area? You know, AIS, in my opinion, is about the most important improvement in, in safety since the compass. Uh, and so I'm constantly seeing who's on the AIS screen to know who we might reach out to via VHF, who's reachable there. So we're always thinking through those scenarios. Um, can, go ahead. Can I just say something, though? <laughs> if, if you don't want to, to, to go through those scenarios, which you, which you can, and everybody should today, the ham radio still exists. And, and not only does it give you the possibility of an emergency like we're talking about today uh, and fear and things like that, but you meet so many people that way. And you are invited to their houses for dinner when you get into Fangaray. Mm -hmm. And, you, and, and, and you, you, you meet so many people that you'll never see in your life, but they're your best friends. And I, it's so easy to get a ham radio license today compared to what I did. And uh, it's, it's something that is on a single sideband radio, if you're going to have a single sideband radio. So even though it's antiquated, uh, because everything is taken over, that is so much more efficient, yep. it still works. <laughs> it still works, and I still use it today. And I can go down, down to my dock and call a friend in New Zealand, and it doesn't cost me a nickel. Perfect segue into systems. Phil, I'm going to start you with this one since you're a resident systems expert. How do you reconcile? Because I feel like philosophically, you are more in line with the, what, what we talked about this morning, prioritizing mission-critical comfort and luxury. So that's how you, 
I get the impression that's how you sell, and yet your business is to sell everyone the third category items, second and third. So how do you reconcile that? Because obviously you're gonna go to see, not many of us are gonna go to see on Matt's 27 footer. That's just not realistic. You're all welcome. So, <laughs> so Phil, how do, you, how do you find that balance between redundancy and uh, important items, but yet still having room for some of the things that make going to see fun? Yeah, I think what you're talking about, of course, is essential systems versus non-essential systems. And what we consider essential has changed over the years. The fact that we're all sitting up here and talking about the importance of an Iridium Go and a backup Iridium device is, is just an example of that. And so technology is constantly evolving. And I, as a systems expert, don't get to decide what technology you put in your boat. Uh, I also don't get to decide what the, the future of boating is going to present to us as options. But uh, you do, because you're consumers of this technology. And so we're gonna to continue to see the demands changing in our industry about what people want on their boats and what also makes them comfortable. So yes, in my business, uh, we do focus on the comfort systems. And we focus on comfort systems for lots of different types of boaters, not just offshore sailors. And so when we're good at our job, we come and we look at the problem and the needs of the customer and if they come to me and say, hey, I'm setting this up, boat up for offshore sailing, but I really also want to be able to keep it dry and comfortable inside so that my crew stays healthy and the, the towels dry up, then maybe we're going to add a, you know, an air conditioning system or something to that boat um, to increase not just their comfort, but their longevity in our sport. Is there any uh, sort of outrageous comfort stories you have? That's not, <laughs> something strange someone's asked for you couldn't believe now yes. is in demand? <laughs> You want to take that? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. So yeah, the classic one is uh, people want ice with no bubbles. Okay. You think that I'm not kidding. So you, you get your ice maker on board and you, you know, you get your ice and you're ready to have your dark and stormy or your rum and ginger, whatever you're going to have. And somehow it's very off putting to see the bubbles in the ice. <laughs> so uh, there are very sophisticated <laughs> systems that are, deliver yeah. bubble free ice. Uh, even aboard sailboats, so and all of you can have that too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but I, I want to post off of what you said a second ago because um, kind of said a little differently. I believe that there are five things that every sailor needs uh, in order to be successful in whatever kind of sailing they want to do, and so this is this is sort of universally applicable. You need time, True. and that's something we have very little of these days. But you need time, you need skill, you need ingenuity. You need grit and you need money. Now, if you have a lot of the first four, you don't need a lot of the last. And so you can pick and choose the combination of those things, those levers that you need, those tools to, to pull on um, in order to reach your sailing goals. But you're gonna need a combination, in my opinion, of, of all five of those. And depending on where your comfort level is, if you're on Matt's end of the spectrum, lots of Balls, no brains. Uh, or maybe you're at the <laughs> other end of the spectrum. Uh, I, I saw the boat when you got around. It was amazing, right? Like, I'm, it gives me night. Talk about fear. Uh, and then where a lot of the clients that I work with today, where we're, you know, they're coming to the sport. They have almost no previous sailing experience, but they bought a 60-footer. Um, and so, you know, they've got all of these things bolted on. And you got to figure out what that combination is. So kind of to your point, but said a little differently, it takes a combination of these personal things that we have, um, and you can figure out what that matrix needs to be to be successful. You know, I, I just have to quickly follow that. Um, I'm pushing 80. And I can tell you something. No, thank Sailing you. keeps you young. That's not the reason I'm talking about it. Um, I really do, and my husband died just after we came home from a long passage across the Atlantic and back, time. And you gotta go before everything is perfect because it'll never be perfect. And I see people, I, I consult with people all the time on boats, on what, you know, how to equip their boats and, and what kind of boats to buy and everything like that. And the thing that I stress the most is get out there and know what you need and then get what you want later because what happens is all of a sudden life goes by and you've got to get out there as soon as you can and start enjoying it and you'll know what you need to add later. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have everything aboard. And, and I think that's 
one of the most important things I learned when my husband died so so young. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the um, it's sort of I was think just thinking about this. We've been talking a lot about purpose, designing your boat or finding your boat, and 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 doing that all with purpose in mind. So um, when I was just coming back to Annapolis yesterday, I was. Uh, got vivid memories of being here at the end of August a couple years ago and living on Ice Bear with, you know, those 100 degree, 100 percent humidity days on a dock. And um, Andy had just asked us to remove the air conditioning from the boat. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, it did work. (laughs) But but we did remove it like we were asked to. But um, but if we'd been if the plan with Ice Bear had been to live in Annapolis in the summers and live aboard like yeah, of course we would have kept the air conditioning and fixed it and improved it, um, but getting rid of it at the time, even though it was very difficult to do uh, emotionally, <laughs> it did make sense later down the road. Um, and now I'm starting to refit my own boat and people keep asking me what I'm doing with the boat and what the plans are with the refit. And I honestly don't know because I'm, I don't want to plan it out too much to a T because I know I'm going to change it along the way and I'd rather you know, I'm, I'm sort of, st- and it's also incredibly overwhelming. Like you look at a boat and mine's pretty much a bare shell right now. Um, but it's overwhelming either way. When you look at the list of things that you could have or the lo- list of the things that you could fix or update, it's, it's completely overwhelming and debilitating. And so I was like, okay, like we have to repower the boat. Let's start there. Let's get a new engine. Let's put it in. And then as we go, okay, now we're going to relocate the fuel filter. And now we're going to look at the, you know, okay, the, the vent on the fuel tank, they ran all the way to the transom for some reason. It was a ridiculously long hose. Why don't we run that over the side? Like, then you make plan, then you figure it out as you go. Um, and as I go with this boat, I'll figure out what I'm going to do with the boat uh, and then purpose build it from there. So to not put all the bells and whistles on. Uh, KB, you have been working um, with a couple who has a brand new boat. And you emailed me the list of things that was put on the boat, I think before the couple even showed up to pick the boat up. Correct. And it was wild. Like, I think there was like a China tea set on that list. That's, that's <laughs> correct. And it, it's still on the boat. Uh, you know, the more you know, the less you need, yeah. right? And uh, it, we have no knowledge, and so we have stuff. Uh, but stuff with no knowledge is never enough to get you there, right? Like, that's, that's sort of... There's this funny little bell curve, I think, in sailing where we start off, where we know nothing, we can go sail on a sunfish, we can go you know, have grand adventures. And then suddenly we know enough to want all the stuff. And then as we get through that process, we go, you know what, I really don't need most of this. What I really need is this, this, and this wow. to be happy. And, and that's, the, that's the journey that we're all on. You know? that's well, how much of it, how, part of our refit on Falcon is we've, we've had enough experience. Now, this is the fourth or fifth boat that I've refit for ocean sailing. So I know more or less exactly what I want. But we've still saved some things for like, let's sea trial the boat first. We sailed it, what, 20 miles from Limington to Cowes in five knots of wind? Yeah, like motored. Yeah. So we're trying to say, all right, this is, we know, exa- we know we want this, 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 and this, but let's stop here, sail the boat for a year, and then realize, okay, what are we missing? Because it's much easier to add than it is to subtract. Um, do you guys feel especially, do you guys have comments on, on that where you end up overdoing it? Well, I know the first time I ever sailed St. Brendan is when I took her around the Americas nonstop, single-handed. See, that was my shakedown. I just took a, a boat to uh, Greenland this year. There was a maiden voyage, a 70-foot boat, by the way. And uh, it was, thank you. And, uh, and being a, a maiden voyage, you're going to learn a lot. And it is a shake. I'm sailing from here to Greenland. It's a heck of a shakedown, uh, a shakedown cruise. Um, but yeah, as far as electronics go, I had very few. I, I'm sure Pam in the 80s go sailing around the world had very few. When I went around the Americas, I had very few. My Pearson, uh, my 323, I took across the Atlantic single-handed, very few. Uh, so you don't need to get too, you know, uh, too in the weeds with, with all sorts of bells and whistles. Uh, but this boat being a, a 72-foot research vessel, we have lots and lots and lots of systems. And it gets, lot, it gets very, very complicated. And it's, it's easy enough to teach somebody how to sail, and you can learn how to reef, you can learn how to heave too, you can learn all this kind of sailing related stuff, but you need to learn to ship systems. And that's harder, I think it's harder in many ways. You gotta learn a bit about the engine to be a mechanic, you gotta learn about the plumbing, the wiring, now you gotta be an electrician. Like you gotta, you don't gotta be like an expert on all of it, but you have to know all your ship systems if you're gonna cross oceans and be out there. And I think that's more complicated than actually learning how to sail. Sailing is a little bit of an interesting 
industry, I think. It's way behind every other industry. So the most technically advanced industry in the world right now in terms of, uh, well, anything. Does anybody know what it is? It's, it's farming, okay? I know it sounds weird, but if you go inside a modern-day tractor today, they can do everything. So they can figure out the most optimized way to, to put, put the corn in the field. It can go and drive itself. It does everything. And sailing, we're still talking about you know, doing yeah, yeah, small diesel engines and doing things all by hand. Um, and so technology evolves, and Matt's exactly right. So in aviation, I was kind of in this weird space growing up and when I was doing my flight training is that we were still doing radio navigation when I started. And when I finished my training, we were flying with glass, which is just screens on the, on the displays, right? So it was a big leap. And we spent, you know, the flying actually ended up being the easy part. And by the end of it, we we're spending more time in the classroom learning the systems part. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think that's what's hard in the sailing world because you do go on the forums, as I say earlier, and people say, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can do that. And technology makes things safer, but it only makes it safer if you know how to use it. And that's that whole systems thing. So if you're gonna install this stuff, you really gotta spend time knowing the systems and not just saying, oh, look at this great tool I've got it's gonna change my life. That's not the case. You gotta sit there and learn it and learn how it works so when it does break, you can fix it and figure out what its limitations are. Yeah, just in, in segue to that too, uh, of course we had to do it, again, because we didn't have anything. But you know, it's the same thing with weather. Yeah. And, and I, I get the giggles today because everybody has so many things that they can look at and say, that's what it's gonna be. <laughs> yeah. but, but what we had was the knowledge from reading books and, 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 and knowing the current and you know, uh, uh, all kinds of things uh, that we could see, that we could see and we could tell what weather yeah. would be coming. Now, you always run a chance crossing the Pacific or the Indian Ocean of coming to something that you don't see you know, a week or two ahead of you. But, you know, there's all kinds of, of, of great books uh, that you can buy. Chris Parker has one, I think. And of course, um, Lee Chesno. Lee, Lee Chesno's book is fantastic. A little confusing to read, but yeah. it still has. But even just like you're saying, Pam, like simple knowledge of clouds and what a, what a cold front looks like. Like I had this, we had this moment in Svalbard this uh, year where the weather um, forecasting is sort of useless like the there's not enough data up there um and the weather's pretty unpredictable and so we'd get you know we'd download a grip every day just because and and it would be the opposite of what we saw outside it'd be like you have 30 knots from the east and we'd look outside and it's glass and um and so the the forecasting was so unreliable that we just sort of ignored the gribs and just looked outside and having the Excuse me, put your finger out. <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> which is also, which you should still do if you are, if we, you know, when we're crossing um, the Atlantic and downlining gribs, sometimes three times a day if there's a lot going on with the weather, you should still look outside because it might be telling you some important information. But in Svalbard, we had no forecasting and we were um, as far northeast as we were going to go. We were about halfway through the trip and we were sort of deciding when we were going to turn around and go home. And we didn't have a forecast, but I looked at the sky and it was like, oh, that's a cold front. And so if that's a cold front, this is what we should expect in the next 24 hours. And that helped us make our decision to start heading back. And sure enough, when we turned the corner, we had headwinds and big black clouds on the horizon um, and a bunch of rain. And so that was really useful to be like, oh, yeah, you can just, you can just look at the clouds. Yeah, but I, I think <laughs> Ryan's point was, was good that, you know, we've gone so far with all this what shall I say, associated information that comes so easily today. Excuse me, but it does. But you get along without it if you want to really delve into why. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and to me, that's part of seamanship. Absolutely. I agree with that 100% and would encourage everybody to practice like you're going to play which means that half the time it's not going to work. <laughs> and therefore, you need to be able to go practice when it and simulate it not working. Great, for instance, I worked with a couple who's planning on doing the Around the World arc in 2024. I was just with them for four days this past week. And so we did a bunch of close quarters boat handling. Well, you'd think that they can handle their boat if they're planning on sailing around the world, and they could. But the bow thruster was not a tool. It was a crutch and one that they relied upon pretty heavily. And so I wouldn't let them put it down. 
I'm the big mean coach, right? Uh, but the point of that is, is that we've got to be able to work with it when it doesn't work. Uh, and that is the case with every system on board the boat. Got to be able to navigate when the chart plotter doesn't work. Got to be yeah, able to communicate you know, when the VHF doesn't work. Absolutely. You know, uh, when we were in the South Pacific and we were going from uh, Western Samoa down to Nukalofa, we saw a mirror flashing, you know, on the horizon. And we, we knew it, it, we couldn't read SOS because it was just flapping back and forth, but we went to the boat. It was a 55-foot boat that we had met in Papiete two years before that, and they had a complete electrical failure. And they were on their way to Nukalofa as well, and, and they knew a compass course because they had been on it. But th you know that volcano that erupted uh, you know, in the, in the Pacific, South Pacific, just last year? We were, that's, that's right between the two, <laughs> you know, where you're leaving from and where you're going from. And I'll never forget that because Andy used to scare the kids. Oh, I hope the volcano doesn't erupt when we're going over. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, anyway, we went, we went to them and they had to follow us 750 miles to get into Nukalova. And this was because they had no previous knowledge or anything aboard the boat that could help them navigate except this new thing called a GPS. Brand new thing. I have a, a question, I guess, it's, I thought of it when Ryan spoke, but um, to all of you, which is, I, I recently listened to a talk um, by a famous French sailor who I naturally can't remember the name of. Um, <laughs> anyway, he made the point that, Ryan, you say sailing's very behind, but he made the point that in the last 40 years, what other industry has quadrupled the speed in which they move <laughs> because 40 years That's ago true. people were sailing around the Whitbread and they were lucky to average 10 knots and now America's cut boats go 40. Um, so why have the systems not stayed at you know I guess evolving at the same pace as the sails? I feel like the I've had this conversation with a bunch of people in the last few years it's like on a lot of our minds I think that the part of the sailing industry that probably most of us are in and care about is a part that's not really being catered to yeah. with the, by the, you know, if, if the America's cup is so unattainable, like if, if for me, I thinking of like, Oh, what if I was an America's cup sailor? Like that's so far away from what I do right now. Um, it's like being an F1 driver. And, and so it's just, and the amount of sort of money and, and it's just so, so far away. Um, and, and then the production boats that are going to be at the boat show this week, like I'm not going to buy any of those boats. And a lot of you are probably also buying used boats. Um, and so there is this, we're sort of using boats that are from 30, 40 years ago and using, therefore trying to put new systems on old boats and marry, you know, old Ray Marine with new Ray Marine and all these things that um, we're all figuring out, but the industry isn't really creating for us. I f and I don't know, you guys probably have, Something it's, to say about that too. Uh, it's, it is weird because I mean there are old airplanes out there that they retrofit with very new technology and it seems to work. Um, so yeah, I've I've asked myself this question too: why why is it so far behind? And it used to be you know not that long ago the airplanes still flew around with scopes so you could read the stars in case the navigation equipment failed and it was celestial navigation with the planes and they did that and then eventually they said no you know what we'll just use radio navigation we can use that as our backup and now most planes don't have any of that and it's all gps it's all electronic le na electronic navigation and for them that's fine and i've been in a plane when you're in the clouds and you can't see anything and stuff fails and it's scary um, but that's no different than being in the ocean when it fails either so yeah i don't know if I've ever come up with an answer to that, but yeah, it just seems like it's really far behind. I have had everything fail once on a delivery to the Caribbean. It was this hunter and it was a piece of junk boat. And I thought my friend who was a delivery skipper full time was like giving me some help. He's like, oh, I got this delivery for you. Oh, well, that's great. Well, he didn't want to do it. And I find out later and it lost all that lost everything about, I don't know, 500 miles north of uh, Puerto Rico. We were taking it. And I always take a, uh, a um, tablet, uh, an iPad with the, the mobile option and have a backup Navionics. Also on my phone, I have backup Navionics. And I understand these are all electrical systems, but uh, it goes back to, to redundancy. And uh, to kind of hit on something they're talking about a minute ago, there is a book if, uh, called uh, Instant Weather Forecasting by Alan Watts that will teach you what the clouds look like. And it's just pictures of clouds and it lets you know like what that means for weather that's coming. It's one of the great books. And it's a lot of fun in the ocean. You can hold it up, like, does the clouds look like this or does it look like this? <laughs> 
That um, book has a barometric chart that goes along with it, which is really cool. Because if you look at what the barometer is trending and the clouds in the sky, you have as accurate of a 48-hour forecast as you're going to get. Now, mind you, Matt, he has never taken my celestial nav class because he says, why do I need that? I'll just sail east or west and eventually run into something. <laughs> You can't get lost in the ocean, you see. You're in the ocean. You know where you are. You probably know which ocean you're in. All jokes aside, that kind of goes to what Nikki was asking about, though. You know, why, haven't, why hasn't technology kept up with the pace of other, of other activities in sailing? And that's because that's part of the attraction, right? Um, you know... The Golden Globes say, at sea right now. Yeah. Deliberately without any technology on purpose. That's a different story, in my opinion. But, that, but it's, uh, it's, it's an attraction. It's it is. An attraction. It is. But um, listen, listen. I think that if you did all celestial navigation, and you probably found this, Andy, when you were going on those passages to Bermuda where everybody was just doing it, there is nothing that can make you prouder of yourself, prouder of your crew, prouder of your boat than making an exact landfall from the moon, the stars, and the sun. And I don't care how electronic you can get with that or how many instruments, you don't have that chuffed feeling, which is most Even if we word. do it now for fun, though, you'll never yeah. really know because you always have the backup. So you, yeah, you, if you we're, be, we're beyond that. But before we get too off topic, Phil, you wanted to say something about on the technology side. Well, I wanted to answer the original question about uh, why is marine industry you know, so far behind technically. We have to remember that all of us are participating in a part of a, an industry that's the niche of the niche of the niche, right? And technology is developed uh, for industries that generate a lot of revenue for these companies that develop the technology, right? I'm sorry, but that's not you. <laughs> okay, so in the marine industry uh, is typically using technology that's been adapted from other industries and been marinized, or it's been reinvented in some way or another. Only once in a while do we get a true innovation that comes in the marine industry, so. That's part of that. And I also have a, a good friend and captain that sails with me every once in a while. Uh, he's much older than I, and he teaches celestial navigation as well. And he sailed with me a couple of times, and, and he told me he teaches celestial navigation. I said, oh, Jeff, next time you come out, you've got to bring your sextant. Come on, we're out here all these days. You're not teaching me how to do it. So the next time he came sailing with us, Jeff brought his sextant. And he started teaching us, and then he's kind of a curmudgeon, but he, <laughs> he basically put it down. He says, you know what? It doesn't matter. He says, it says right there where you are. <laughs> so this is a guy who teaches celestial and doesn't bring his sextant with him. So, you know, it's... Uh... Yeah, we were doing celestial on our way to Bermuda, keeping time on the iPad. And so, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a crossover also add, there. I also want to add that, uh, you know, when we talk about systems, generally speaking, we're talking about many different systems that can be categorized in different ways. And I think the electronics and navigation electronics that category of discussion kind of lives on its own. And when you start talking about other systems, they also live on their own. And, and those are topics probably for another panel. Um, it won't get in depth into it now. But the one bit of advice I give to you from the, from the professional trade is that if you, if you have a little bit of that fifth item, the money, then you'll be really well suited to work with um, professional systems designer for your boat or someone who can at least consult. Because when you're outfitting uh, for any kind of sailing or boating and you want to make maybe a few upgrades or repairs, uh, the only, even if you are a pretty, pretty capable DIYer, the only way you're going to do a great job is if you've done it already before. That's a good point. We're going to be really awesome at refitting the next FAR 65. <laughs> <laughs> can, um, I, can, I make, can I make a confession? And, and this will be just between us, Okay. I've always poo-pooed a bow thruster because I felt as though you lost some of your seamanship using a bow thruster. And since I'm getting pretty, you know, long in the tooth, my son decided it was time that I didn't jump three feet to get onto the dock when I'm coming alongside. So he got me a present of a bow thruster. And guess what? This is my confession. I love it! <laughs> I love mine too. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> Mine's broke right now. I have to dock without it, and yeah. I, I this need is to get a fixed. this is a fantastic segue. My next question was going to be for each of you, just starting with Phil, go down the line. What is your favorite piece of unnecessary, non-mission critical equipment? Because we all have that. Mine's a water maker. Definitely air conditioning. <laughs> That's a hard one, man. I I think water maker came into my mind. First as well, yeah, I, that thing's awesome. Mm, it's 
Sorry, I'm thinking. Uh, oh, I guess, okay. Watermaker, yes. Um, even though with some of what we do, I do think it's mission critical for our trips, but that's that's the purpose, the purpose thing again. Um, probably the freezer. Oh, yeah. I have yeah. to change my answer. Okay. <laughs> Central vacuum. Central <laughs> vacuum. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> life changer. <laughs> oh, man. I, I think my turntables are essential. <laughs> that, yeah, all right. So Matt actually is not kidding. He has a set of turntables on his research schooner. Yeah, I got a big boat. I got a room for him. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, All right, I, so turntables and central vacuum. I would not have predicted those two answers, I think. Is central vacuum, is that a thing on boats? Yes, on a 42-foot sailboat. On a 42-foot? Where's the vacuum? It's more of a centrally installed vacuum with a long hose, but it's, <laughs> it's really, really great. They put them on big power boats a lot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're like behind the scenes. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pam? Well, I, I, you know... We never wanted a, a water maker because our boat was a water maker. Um, it was part of the kids' job every night before we went to sleep to get the t tender absolutely crystal clear, especially like in the Bahamas or where there's a lot of rain, and it would fill up with rain overnight, and then you'd get in the, put the detergent in and put the, put the laundry in the, in the dinghy, and then you pretend you were Lucille Ball, you know, <laughs> and stomp around in it a little bit. And, Actually, it was fun, you know, I mean, so we didn't need a washing machine. That's how machine. you look this good when you're 80. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, don't smell me. I haven't had a shower since last summer. <laughs> I mean, a bathtub. <laughs> but um, I think the one thing, because my son has been so good to me, he's put in the toilet now. I have a toilet, not a bucket, which is really nice of him. Um, I think that the most important thing to me um, which we had from the very beginning, was a eutectic system refrigerator, especially for long passages. Because when Andy and I first started sailing, probably like you, you know, it was all in cans and all in oh, yeah, out of both, you know, I'm <laughs> rice with weevils in it and, you know, that kind of thing. But I think today, um, I think I'd like to have new solar panels. My solar panels are now 30 years old. And I think solar panels have come so far um, and that's our only means. We can't plug into a, a dock. We'd, we've never had that. We're strictly a DC boat. So the solar panels, the new ones, you know, with the crystals and everything, if you want to give me a Christmas present, <laughs> then, 255 waters, okay? Thank you. Uh, I think for me, it's probably the cordless wet dry vac. Oh, yeah. Kristen, that, you changed my life with that. Yeah, I'm I serious. mean, so there, there are three tools that I bring to every boat that I work with. A cordless drill, uh, and you can do Makita, DeWalt, uh, or Milwaukee, whichever you prefer. Uh, Makitas are nice if you're going to be traveling in Europe because they have a really good uh, European-style charger. Uh, but that battery pack then fits in the angle grinder, the cordless drill, and the wet dry vac. And with those three tools, you can pretty much do anything you ever need. So well, you can get, get the biggest one you have storage for because you'll love it. But the, the, the littlest one that I work with is like a little R2-D2 unit. It's like tiny. And it is amazing because you got to go suck something up or they inflate the inflatable fenders. It's fantastic. I got, uh, I got something that can beat that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say vacuum cleaner. Um, but then I remembered the, the, most, the most important non-critical thing on the boat. Crew. <laughs> Zing. Uh, all right, so let, I want to I want to shift gears a little bit now and start talking a bit more about um, about strategy and looking ahead. KB, you weren't here for the morning session, but you sort of parroted what we said about always. Uh, you said it in a much more elegant way, but predicting the future, never reacting, always being proactive. Um, so I want to hear some examples, um, if you guys can think of some sea stories or something where you had that attitude. I'm going to start with you, KB, since you brought the topic up and we'll just come down the line this way. You had the attitude of being proactive and it helped a situation which, if you weren't ready for it, may have gone uh, in a different direction. Yeah, I have a lot more stories about where I didn't do it right than the way I did it right, but... Um you know, I, I think it comes back to time. For me, you know, the greatest threat to sailing writ large is uh, either the Peloton or kids' soccer. 
Um, and what I mean by that is, is that most of you in this room can go in 45 minutes and feel like you accomplished something with no previous experience and very little skill on a Peloton. And that's satisfying. But you can't do that on a sailboat. You need to invest the time. And then that spills over into the rest of our lives and we don't commit enough time to the things that matter most. Um, and so time is the most important of all of those five things that I mentioned. And uh, I have clients who have sailed around the world and never saw more than 30 knots of breeze and did so for a very brief period of time because they had time. Their 24 month circumnavigation ended up taking four years, but that's okay. They had time and they had a great experience doing it. So um, I, have, I have delayed many a trip because something wasn't right. Either there was a system that I wasn't willing to depart with it not being fixed um, and there are plenty of systems that I leave with that they are broken or not working because you can't wait for it all to be perfect, as, as she said. Um, but if something critical isn't right, don't go. Uh, and so time becomes super important. That's um, kind of the paradox. I mean, you and I worked on the rallies together. You, you have a, a set start date, which is an excellent goal to work towards because if you don't have a deadline, you, can, you never leave. But you have a deadline and it goes against what you just said. It totally does. And I get paid to go against what I just said all the time. <laughs> you know, I help people get from point A to point B and their schedule is dictating when we leave and when we need to be there. And, um, and so I bump up against it all the time. But there's definitely got to be a threshold where you're willing to say, I know this is going to be super difficult, but we're not going. Um, or we're pausing. You can pause at sea. It's a lot easier to slow down than it is to speed up in the ocean. Uh, and so um, I, I'll give you a, an amazing technology connection to that idea. Uh, anybody here use Luck Grib as your grib viewer? I'm addicted to it. I think it's amazing. And Craig McFeeters is such a, an available developer. It's a really cool uh, program. I highly recommend it. I will, we're going to do a very deep dive on that tomorrow. Awesome. Because that's what I use as well. They just added the ability to have Heave 2 as one of the sailing modes in your route planning. That's awesome. Right now, I don't click that box when I'm planning a race from Newport to Bermuda because we would not likely heave two in a race. Um, but if I'm going to be cruising, which I will be the first week in November to Bermuda, uh, if it's going to be gnarly enough to heave two, that's an indicator that I probably need to delay the departure. Um, but it's nice to be able to see that in the grip file. It's really cool. Andy, what was the question again? An example of somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, an example of. An example of something where you were acting in a proactive manner that uh, got you out of a situation which had you waited and just reacted to it um, so, so to the point of being proactive instead of reactive in the moment when you're at sea. Oh, you, ha you have to be at sea. Okay. Or, or not necessarily. Okay. Answer it however you want. You can interpret no, it however you want. My advice to everybody here in this room is never tell anyone when you're planning to leave. <laughs> because... You know, I kept saying, oh, we're going to leave in December. We're going to leave in December. And then a year passed, and we couldn't leave because we didn't have enough money to leave. And then everybody would said, oh, I thought you'd be in Australia by now. And I got so sick of saying to them, we never left yet. And then, I mean, you know, so that, that's just a little bit of advice, okay? Um, but um, I'm trying to think of something... Andy, I can't, I can't. I'm going to ask Matt. I have a very specific question for Matt. Matt, okay. I remember when you came back from the, um, around the Americas, I was out in the media boat that when you sailed into Annapolis and several people had asked me, did Matt get new sails just for the arrival into Annapolis for like this thing? And people were surprised at how well your sails had held up after 309 continuous days at sea. And I think that's a perfect example of being proactive. And if you want to talk about the detail of how, how they held up so well. Uh, sure. Um, I am a terrible racer. I would lose every race. I'm a defensive sailor. I've always been a defensive sailor. And so I always think in terms of defense. So reef early, reef often. I'm very happy going a little bit slower. I tend to push boats at 80, 90%. I rarely push them at 100% unless there's a storm, a gale, I don't know, some reason you gotta get really moving. Uh, do a lot of boat deliveries for years and years. I'm about to do my 30th trip to the Caribbean a couple of weeks. And you got to make sure the boat shows up in the same condition it left, and that's defensive sailing. Uh, so yeah, I just reefed a lot. I, I take very good care of. Uh, well, I, 
on that trip, it was such a long trip because I was out there for 309 days that it was just sort of like whatever, you know. I mean, I can bob around, I can drop sails if I have to. I also use drogues and parachute sea anchors uh, at times, uh, which can obviously alleviate some of the stress because you're not going to have your sails up if you're on, at least on a parachute sea anchor. Uh, but I think most of that situation was just reef early, reef often, and, and who cares how long it takes you to get there. I remember a guy telling a story at a bar at Davis's in Annapolis. Oh, I crossed the ocean in 16 days, da 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 And I worked for a sailmaker back then. Next day, he showed up with the sails, and they were to beat to death. And uh, that was just one transatlantic. And to go piggyback again off some Christian said, for a situation this year of a preemptive scenario, uh, when I had to cross the Labrador Sea to get to Greenland, um, instead of heaving two, I saw a big storm coming. I was gonna sail right into like 50 knots of wind in the Labrador, which is just a nasty body of water. And so I deployed a drogue, uh, I could have hove two, uh, but heaving two would have stopped me more than I needed. So I just put out a drogue ahead of time and for about, I don't know, 48 hours or 36 hours or so, we rode at you know maybe three and a half, four knots on a drogue and it wasn't uh, using a drogue in the traditional sense in a storm, which I've done also, uh, but it did slow me down enough that when we got there, it was blowing 30, and the heart of that storm had, had moved by, so we didn't get hit by it. Uh, so I don't know if a, if a drogue can be a piece of equipment, but, uh, but it's definitely saved my backside a few times. But that's defense, it's just defensive sailing. Yeah, I'm thinking also back to talking about fear, and I think a huge strategy that I discovered uh, when I was starting to sail offshore a few years ago was the sort of go through all the scenarios in your head, because um, someone I just met mentioned to me that uh, they heard me talk about how I loved sailing at night on the podcast and the secret is I hated it the first night I was sailing offshore like it was horrifying I was like the boat kind of feels like it's going downhill for some reason when it's really dark out and I was on it was on a solo watch and I was like I have no idea what to do if and I didn't even know what was going what could go wrong so I didn't I was like I don't know what could go wrong and if it did happen then I don't know what I would do about that situation it was I was totally spooked um, but it was definitely a push for me to start to go through those scenarios of like, okay, what if what if the jib halyard breaks and the sail comes down in the middle of the night, and and what if the you know the gooseneck breaks and the boom falls off, and what if you know all these like what if situations that can make you spiral and freak out, um, but can also empower you to like find the solutions and make a plan. And um, Lisa Blair, who uh, I have talked to several times, she's the fastest. She's sailed around Antarctica nonstop solo and unassisted faster than anyone else she's nuts and Didn't her podcast come out yesterday yeah it did, you did? Um, yeah about her most recent trip and she has like a tolerance to like fear and weather that i cannot understand but she does the same thing she's like i prepare in my head of what could go wrong what do i do what could, and for her what could go wrong is more like her boat getting rolled 180 degrees upside down and the mast coming off and which did happen to her <laughs> and and so she prepares for those scenarios um, and I'll prepare for those in my head too if I'm getting nervous. And I think that's been a thing for me that's been proactive um, because I was skippering a trip with a bunch of teenagers in the Caribbean this summer and the jib did fall down in a squall in the middle of the night in between just off of St. Vincent where the chop gets pretty uh, sloppy. And um, yeah, we were in the middle of a squall, middle of the night, and I have a bunch of 16 year olds on board. And uh, my first mate was um, sort of panicking and the jib came down and was falling into the water and um, the our lazy jacks that held up the sort of boom, whatever sail cover thing had also broken and that's flapping in the wind. But it was actually okay because I had thought through that kind of scenario in my head several times before on a night watch when I'm wondering what could go wrong and, and then it was all right, we dealt with it. Um, it wasn't like a, something I'd never thought of before it suddenly happened, I'd thought of it on night watches dozens of times. So I feel like that's a strategy I've used. Yeah, having just on that. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, having sailed with Iron Emma, she also does a couple of other things that are, and I've, she does them better than anybody I've ever sailed with, uh, which is she gets the crew prepared for what's gonna come next by one, briefing everybody with as much information as she has available to her um, and getting them fed properly for the conditions that we expect. So uh, if it's going to be bumpy and weird and, you know, one of those vertigo inducing nights where people are going to get sick, um, she has always done a really good job of making sure people are hydrated and fed with the right stuff. Lasagna? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Yeah, something to really color it up a little bit, right? Uh, so, but no, she, in all seriousness, she's, uh, she's such a forward thinker about crew health. 
um, in that regard, and it's cool to sail with. I found, go ahead. Sorry, Pam. I, I found that a lot of times with other cruisers that we've met out there, is, and, and we're guilty of it ourselves, is that you get into this rut where you see everybody else doing something, so you feel like you might need to do something. A good example of that is some of these rallies. They leave on a specific day. It's blowing 45 knots, and you know that that's not the condition that you want to be going out on, but you go out in it anyways because that's what everyone else is doing. So our, I think it was our second day that Sophie and I, so we had left Stockholm. This was four and a half years ago now. We went down just a, a few hours outside of Stockholm. The next day we left and it was, it was blowing like 25 knots, which today for us isn't that bad, but back then it was, and it was right on the nose. And we got out into the Baltic Sea and the boat was just slamming. And we, you know, like, and because I thought this was the next day of our trip. We got to go. Like, if we can't handle 25 knots, what are we doing out here? <laughs> and eventually we realized, what are we doing? And we, like, this is so stupid. We have time, as Kristen said. So we turned around, went back, and we ended up spending like another week sitting there. And that was the best decision for us. And it happened so early on in the trip where we said, you know what? It's okay to wait. It's okay to turn around. That's fine. It's going to make for a better trip later on. And so there's a number of occasions now that we have gone out. We realized it's not what we thought it was. That another day is going to come. It's going to be much better. And we turn around and, you know, that's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, so how do you, how do you now, how have you changed the way you think about it in a pre preemptive way so that you think you make those decisions right before you leave this time? Yeah, I mean, some of it's experience, right? So you look at the weather. It used to be you look at the weather. You don't. You you think you know what that weather is telling you, but then you get out there and you realize it's actually something a little different, and it is actually what the weather told you. So now experience is built up, and so I can look at something and say, all right, I know this is how the boat's going to behave. This is how we are going to behave as a couple on the boat. So that helps, but that that's not so much uh, preemptive. I think I've just I personally am more comfortable with the fact that it's okay to wait and it's okay to change those plans because that's for at least for us that was something very hard to do. Uh, when I met Kristen for the first time, I think it was uh, this was in Bermuda two years ago. We we just stopped off in Bermuda for like a day or two to pick <laughs> up a part, and we ended up being there for three and a half weeks <laughs> because because of the rum swizzle. The, yeah, because well, that's for Sophie. Yeah, she probably was. <laughs> she loves that rum swizzle. No, we ended up being there for like she. We ended up being there for three and a half weeks because we just didn't like what the weather was doing going across the Atlantic, and so we said, you know what, it's okay. We would probably be okay, but. What? Like we have the Ryan, time. It's because you love Bermuda. <laughs> I do love Bermuda. It's a little too expensive on the wallet, but I love Bermuda. No, so we ended up doing that. So we stayed a long time and we knew a few people that left in those kind of okay weather windows. And they left like a week and a half before us and they only arrived two days before us. You know, so they were just out there bobbing around while we were having, Sophie was having rum swizzle <laughs> <laughs> and we were having a good time on land. So that's that forward thinking, you know, just doing sometimes it's better. Well, the old aviation saying is it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the sky than in the sky wishing you were on the ground. And it's very true in sailing. So, yeah. you know, and I think it's really important to, to codify what you and Sophie came to the conclusion of. It isn't real if it isn't written down. And so I coach every team that I work with to set parameters of what their acceptable mm -hmm. range of going or not going is so that they agree upon the go, no go decision. And somebody can't have an overt influence in that uh, decision making. So, you know, if, if 25 knots is your cap and that's okay if it is, um, then, then if you expect there to be 25 knots on the trip, there's a no go decision right there. Right. But if you don't write it down and you don't agree upon it, then there's always something that talks you into it, and that can be really regrettable. And Kristen is a couples counselor in his day job. <laughs> we we had I did that. have somebody say to me recently, I don't know if he knows anything about sailing, but he's a great marriage counselor. So I'll put in, that on a shirt. In aviation, we had it. It's the same thing. It's called personal minimums. So it's what are your personal minimums as yourself and your crew? Have those written down. And I mean, there's a lot of other industries that do that. I don't know why some of that doesn't get carried over into this business, but yeah, we can learn a lot from that. So. I, I have Phil, some. I hang have on, Pam. Fun. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you. Phil's been trying to talk over here, but he's not as he's not as uh, as strong as KB at the other end of the That's table. Okay. Here, you so. guys are saying a lot of good stuff. I, I think the question was about uh, when is the time you've acted proactively and how did that benefit you? And the trouble with trying to answer that question is, well, if it benefited me, maybe I don't know what the alternative would have been, right? And I can think about a time I, I joined a friend's boat. I, I met a boat. Um, 
in December uh, to sail from Norfolk to Bermuda. And uh, this friend of mine, he, he had mentioned that he was having some engine trouble uh, before he got to Norfolk. And so we looked some things over and, um, and we said, well, we should sample the diesel fuel because of the symptoms he was talking about were, were causing problems and we maybe we saw some water in the, in the Raycor filters. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is, um, this is the type of stuff that you should learn. Uh, this is not something you hire out to somebody else. You gotta know about the cleanliness of your diesel fuel. So we, we figured out that uh, we needed to take a sample from the bottom of his diesel tank because w water is heavier than diesel and it sits on the bottom. And so we started pulling water out of the tank and we ended up siphoning out uh, probably like eight milk jugs full of water out of this diesel tank. And so that was us being really proactive and we went and we did this trip and um, then pulling into Bermuda, the first time we started the engine on the trip, the engine died <laughs> and, uh, since, since leaving Norfolk. And uh, well, it, and it was really, really rough um, trying to get in and, and we had headwinds. And, uh, it was the tank was full of water again, and we had taken a lot of green water over the deck. And uh, well, I can only assume that the fuel fill was leaking, right? So we had seawater in the diesel tank, which wasn't a good situation. So uh, long story short, we all try to be proactive, and in that case, we did everything we could to avoid the the situation, and it happened anyway. And that's a good point. Do you guys know the theme song to Norfolk? No. We don't smoke, we don't drink, nor fuck, nor fuck. <laughs> Sorry. Andy, I have one more answer to your question. I was thinking about it, okay? And it's a very personal, it's a very personal one, but it very well may affect a lot of you. Uh, and this was one of the reasons that I also got the ham radio. It was very difficult for us as a family to leave my family and know that we didn't know when we were coming back. And um, especially when my parents were getting older. And that's another reason that the ham radio was so wonderful because I could call my parents anytime, anywhere, through another ham radio operator that would pick up my CQ. And uh, I tell you what, it made for me as an emotional departure from my family, which was a very close family, feel so much better and not fear that I couldn't keep in contact with them. And whenever I wanted to, and it didn't cost me a nickel because of the ham radio, you don't pay, you know, you just get. To, to dive deeper on that, that's a really good, the, the setting up a communication framework and also what happens if that breaks down, because there's nothing worse than expecting communication from a boat if you're ashore, because now that Mia and I don't sail anymore, one of us is home with Axel, one's at sea, if I'm expecting something from her and it doesn't come, that's very easy to get stressed and wonder what's going on. Or Same they, thing with trackers nowadays. Yeah. If the tracker stops working for a ping or something, it's um, that needs to be managed ahead of time. Emma, what were you going to say? Well, just the, also the other way around, like I, both of us, but I've seen you react when we're on the boat and we're at sea. And when you're on shore, you can get a text anytime. And you know that, that back and forth is really normal. But when you're at sea, you're kind of isolated out there. And you might just get one email a day, if you're lucky, um, from someone on land. And so when that email doesn't come in, you know, and also your sense of time's all off on your watch schedule, you know, I've seen Andy like, you know, be like, she, why isn't she talking to me? Is she, she mad at me? You know, like that sort of reaction because you, you're so isolated out there and, and your partner's back in, you know, the world of, of text messages and, and FaceTime. So it is good to have those expectations. And, you know, we I think you guys do a good job of, of letting our crew know um, or people at home uh, when, when we're at sea, like if we do drop off the tracker, that doesn't mean that the boat just sank. Like there are a lot of other things to step to. And you guys had this when, yeah. when your Iridium Go went. I remember I was following your trip and I was like, Oh shit! They haven't, you know, they haven't pinged in three days. Yeah, like, where'd they go? Yeah, my mom had her own stresses about that. Yeah, <laughs> and and so the first thing is not to call the coast guard. Like, uh, yeah, there's other so Tracking setting up those systems expectations. systems are for moms. That's what I've found. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had my dad call the coast guard one time. The the first time I sailed alone across the Atlantic, I had hit by a tropical storm, and there was another, and my tracker stopped working. And there was another uh, single hander who got rescued by a helicopter, and he thought it might be me, and so he called the the coast guard, freaking out about it. And so it's like, it's a weird balancing act because these tracking devices are great. People follow along, but at the same time, it's like, you got to tell people if I, if it disappears for a couple of days, it doesn't necessarily mean I sunk, but maybe I did, you know? So it's like, you know, there's a, of course the EPIRB ultimately is the, is the device to use in that situation. 
but it is kind of like this weird, you know, I, I find don't communicate too much because then people are like, why aren't you talking? It's yeah, like, well, I'm totally. at sea, man. I'll talk to you when I get back to land. I think there's this, uh, there's clearly a theme here. We, we asked, hey, what pro preemptive um, decisions have you made that have gone well? And there's clearly a, a theme which perhaps isn't talked about that much. There's half of you guys are answering this question about like, I did this practical thing that helped me out. But it's almost 50-50 the weight from that very open question, the weight 50% is on practical and 50% is on essentially emotional, mm. emotional preparation for yourself and for your crew. And if you read a book about sailing, there is not 50% of that book based dedicated to a, like an emotional um, like preparation and management. And actually it's clearly from the professional standpoint, very important. We've started saying on our channel that there's three things you need to take care of before you go cruising. The first is you need to get your finances in order because you can't, if you can't pay for things, it's not going to work out. Second is you need to figure out your boat, which is a lot of what's been talked about today. And the third, which is the thing that nobody talks about is you have to figure out your mental state yourself and your relationship state with whoever you're going cruising with. Uh, and we did not do that third piece <laughs> and it was a bit of trial by fire. We're still trying to figure it out. Uh, but it, it is really, really important on, on that piece to get the emotions because this, this world will test that more than you can believe it will. And then you take your, your emotions are being tested and then you might be seasick and you might yeah. be over exhausted and then you, everything is strained to the max. And so, uh, we didn't talk about that today, but that's going to come tomorrow. I think, yeah. um, We've got about 15 minutes left, um, and I think Nikki's point on emotions is a great way to kind of wrap that up. I, I don't know how much of that is like all of us are friends, and we're also all pretty similar emotional people, so maybe that would be a different answer if I had different panelists up here, but I, I, I think it's very important, and I'm glad we touched on that. Um, I want to open this up to, to questions from you guys. Um, we have the panelists for the next 15 minutes. Um, let's just start. If you guys can... Come up to the stage so we can get this on mic, um, and we'll and we'll get this recorded because, like I said, it's going to be a podcast. So just say your name and then ask your question. Yeah, hi, my name's Dan, and um, hi, Dan. I'm I'm listening, uh, Dan Steinbring, and um, this has been fantastically informative. But if I were listening to this panel uh, from, if I were listening to this panel from uh, a perspective of somebody who might think about going blue water cruising, what I haven't heard is, why the hell would I do this? <laughs> Maybe we'll, well fly through. Well, Dan, you've asked the right question. <laughs> uh, when we figure it what? out, we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll just share my brief thought on that. It, it's so highly personal. Uh, why you do it. Everybody has their motivation to go to sea. And I think to Ryan and Sophie's um, three things that you need, uh, understanding the why is also important. Um, why we do things because the why becomes the filter that helps you make a bunch of decisions. Um, if you are going to see to get away from it all, you need fewer comms tools. Um, if, you're, <laughs> if you're trying to work, and cruise the Caribbean, you need a lot of comms tools. So what's the why is really, really important. And it's so deeply personal that um, I don't think any one of us would be able to answer it for you, um, but it is definitely worth spending time considering it because it'll help you answer a difficult question down the road. Yeah, I think we uh, at 59 North, at least, we get a lot of people who come sailing with us who are asking themselves that question and they show up and they say, I just don't know if I'm gonna like it. So that's why I'm here to see if I like it. And the fact that they showed up to do it, I'm like, you're gonna like it, like you're screwed. <laughs> you're, gonna be, you're gonna be in it for a while. And I see some of you in the room who are in that camp of, uh, of yeah, you, you get the bug. Um, and I remember realizing that for myself uh, on one of my first offshore trips, seeing the electric dolphins, as we call them, when the, yeah. when the dolphins are swimming through bioluminescence and they're glowing in the dark. And there's just these so things good. that you can't even imagine that happen at sea. You're uh, overcoming hardship with a crew. Um, but, but you do have to find out for yourself. And usually if you think you're gonna like it, you will. But I have had people come sailing offshore and say thank you very much, but 
I like my lake sailing. I'm good, you know. In this Norm- is where we all start crying, I think. Yeah, that is, we, we do I, cry a lot at the end of the trips, right, right, Kristen? I cry a lot. Every time. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> I think in normal life, you get, these, you get these highs and lows. We all have that, right? It's cyclical. It, not every day is good. So we have good days and bad days, and it kind of does like this. But you do on land, too. It, yeah. Exactly, on land. And I think in the sailing life, at least for Sophie and I, it's just much more extreme. So the highs are really high. And that's that's the thing I think that at least drives us. It's like these high days and you're like, whoa, we just experienced something that nobody else. But then the lows are very low. And it puts life in perspective a little bit more, I'd say. So it's it's just the same as land life. It's just more extreme. Uh, it, the, when I crossed the Pacific nonstop, I think it took me 50, 64 days. I was on a 29-foot day sailor, a harbor 29. Um, and then it took me like 14 hours to fly back. So 14 hours, you know, 64 days. But I think that, at least for myself, there uh, a why is that there is a spirit of exploration that lives inside of all of us, and some people feel it more than others. And there's also a self of a, uh, a, a feeling of accomplishment that you can get, like climbing a really big mountain, uh, crossing an ocean. You get to the other side, and you're over in Europe sailing around, and you're going to be proud. Every time you look at your boat, every time you think about what you've accomplished, so I think it's that combination of, of having that inner explorer and, and embracing uh, exploration. And, and exploration used to mean discovery. And you're not going to discover a new island, but you're going to discover things about yourself and, and your crew or your family or whoever you have with you. And exploration is a physical expression of intellectual passion, so we should never stop exploring. So I really think it's that combination of embracing your inner Shackleton, so to speak, your inner explorer, uh, combined with an overwhelming sense of accomplishment, you just can't find on land or by taking airplanes. Well said. Woo! Thank you. My job. Uh, very, very close to what you're talking about. Andy and I always used to say to me, what I like about being out here is I'm totally responsible for the crew of this boat and for this boat. And I like it, the fact that I am the totally responsible person and except for weather and sea state and things like that, which I've learned to be able to read, I like it that I don't have to rely really on anyone else but my crew and my vessel. And to me, that is the most wonderful feeling of accomplishment in my life. And I think that's what, what it was for, for our family. I'd like to add that in my experience, um, more often than not, when I've gone offshore, I've reached points where I've really wanted to quit sailing. And then I, I really adopted this mantra, this kind of negative mantra that was that sailing is suffering. And I had these really, really low experiences. It seemed like the low experiences were really outnumbering the, the high mm-hmm. ones, you know? And maybe we've all, we've all felt that. And, and I, would, I would get in this place and then finally finish a passage or something and some time would pass and be gearing up to do it again. <laughs> and uh, I can't explain it, but it really says something if the lowest experiences of my life happen at sea and I keep doing it. And you know, I think the greatest thrill is the first sight of land, and it's the piece of land you want it to be. (laughs) (laughs) And the saddest thing is when you put down the anchor. We're just going through that right now. I just got done to the 116-day expedition, and you're stuck on the same boat with the same people for 116 days, and are driving you completely crazy, but there is almost a sadness, you know? The, the, The adventure's over. But only for now, you know, there's always next year. Exactly. Nikki, why do you do it? <laughs> Annie just wants me to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> I can resonate with everyone. I think it's the, the, the big highs. Um, the big highs and also sharing those highs with other people. Um, to me, um, the best moments of life are shared and not just feeling how beautiful things are for myself and how incredible the world is and the perspective you get on land at sea and the perspective you get on how we fit into this big strange universe but also seeing people discover that as well is so magical especially people discovering it for the first time um and then them coming back for more and i think it makes people the best versions of themselves. Overall, sometimes the worst. And don't you all, <laughs> don't, you also, don't you also think that the people you meet that you could never meet from an airplane or a car or a bus or a train 
you're meeting the real people from your boat, and you become such good friends with them, and they're such different people from your lifestyle. Yeah. And I think that was the most glorious thing that we did for our children, was to show them that there's someone other than who lives across the street. Yeah, yeah like it's like a place, the sea is kind of a place where all the nomads belong, I think. All of my best friends are in this room right now, and I've, all, I've spent time at sea with all of them, and that's why they're my best friends. Um, I was, we were gonna take more questions, but we can't possibly end on a better note than, than, than this. So uh, I wanna thank you guys. We'll wrap this up here. Any questions you had, save them for the Q&A tomorrow. And um, thank, thank you guys, awesome. And uh, I think those of us that are here are all gonna be around the boat show this week. So uh, come on down and see us. Thank you everyone for coming. Be back here. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Back here tomorrow, um, same time. We'll start right at 9 o'clock, and uh, we've got another full day of this. So thank you, guys. I'm going to have a beer at the bar if anybody wants to come <laughs> hang out there. Thanks again to Forbes Horton Yachts for sponsoring this season of the podcast. Get in touch with Forbes at ForbesYachts.com. That's F-O-R-B-E-S Yachts.com. Thanks again to Dive Blue for supporting this season of On The Wind. Head on over to DiveBlue.com to check out the various setups they offer. That's D-I-V-E-B-L-U, the number three, dot com. On the Wind is the podcast about sailing, created by 59 North and hosted by me, Andy Schell, and guest hosted by Nikki Henderson, August Sandberg, and Emma Garshagen. The show is mixed and produced in Frederick, Maryland by our own Lee Cumberland. Episode artwork and website show notes are created by Laura Parent out in San Francisco. The intro theme music is composed and performed by former podcast guest, sailor, and musician Cameron Dale, while the outro music you're hearing right now is, of course, by our friends Stormweather Shanty Choir out of Bergen, Norway. We love hearing from our fans, so send your questions and comments to holdfast at 59-north.com, and please do us a favor and review the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, hold fast. I made up me mind that I was inclined to go to sea no more. No more, no more, to go to sea no more. I made up me mind that I was inclined to go to sea. As I was walking down the street, I met sweet Angeline. She said, come home with me, me lad, and we'll have a cracking time. But when I awoke, it was no joke, I found I was all alone. My silver watch and my money too And my whole bloody gear was gone Was gone, was gone My whole bloody gear was gone It was when I awoke it was no joke For my whole bloody gear was gone as I was walking down the street, I met Big Rapper Brown. I asked him if he would take me in, and he looked at me with a frown. He said, Last time you was paid off with me, you talked up no score. But I'll take your advance and I'll give you a chance to go to sea once more. 
Sometimes we're catching whales, me lads, but mostly we get none. With a twenty foot oar in every pour from five o'clock in the morn. And when daylight's gone and the night's coming on, we rest up on our oars. And oh boys, you wish that you was dead Or snug with the girls ashore Ashore, ashore Or snug with the girls ashore Oh boys, you wish that you was dead Or snug with the girls ashore Come all you seafaring lads that listen to me song When you go a big boating boys make sure you do not go wrong You take my tip when you come off a trip don't go with any horns but get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more. No more, no more to go to see no more. Get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more. No more. see no more get married instead and have all night in bed and go to see no more